A long time ago, I came across this photo of an abandoned Disney World animatronic that used to be within a submarine ride at the Magic Kingdom. The photo itself is very eerie, and the concept probably unlocks some submechanophobia that I never knew I had. But the real story behind this is actually pretty interesting. It's from an attraction called 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, a once beloved opening day ride at the park, and one that ultimately closed in the 90s and mysteriously sat abandoned for years. So today, let's take a both metaphorical and literal dive into the story of this highly requested topic, hear from a cast member who actually worked at the attraction, and find out why it was ultimately left abandoned. This episode is sponsored by Incogni. Use code BRIGHTSUN at the link below to get an exclusive 60% off an annual plan. The concept of a submarine attraction in a Disney park, or any park for that matter, began in the late 1950s with Disneyland's new expansion of Tomorrowland. It carried on with the theme of new and exciting technology, submarines being one of them. It was called the Submarine Voyage, and it was basically a series of half-submerged 38 guest ride vehicles that would have portholes looking underwater for each guest. The submarine vehicles would follow a 1,300-foot underwater track where they would journey through a labyrinth of underwater props and effects. It became a very popular attraction at Disneyland. So by the time the company was beginning to plan their new park in Florida, a version of this ride was a must. In fact, Walt Disney World's submarine attraction could be seen in the earliest master planning concepts for the park. It wouldn't be until 1969, though, when the attraction was finally announced, a now expanded concept of the Disneyland version, now with a new theme. 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea Submarine Voyage, as its name suggests, was based on the classic Jules Verne novel by the same name. It tells the story of Captain Nemo and his adventures aboard the Nautilus, traveling 20,000 leagues across the ocean. It was also a story that was adapted for the big screen in Walt Disney Productions' 1954 film of the same name. The iconography of that film would be translated into this new attraction, first with the subs being commissioned by a yacht builder on Florida's west coast, ultimately being trucked across the state to the park, which by this point was gearing up for the grand opening. Ultimately, 20,000 Leagues came in around $800,000 over budget, with the company spending what is the equivalent of around $67 million to build. Regardless, it would open more or less with the rest of the park on October 10th, 1971. Immediately from opening day, the ride was very popular. Much like the ride system it was based on over in Disneyland, this too would follow an underwater track and discover various environments around the tank. After simulated diving bubbles cover the guest portholes, the subs would pass underwater sets of aquatic plants, animals, and even divers. After another bubble sequence simulating even further descent, the subs would enter the covered show building. There, guests would pass by shipwrecks and deep oceans filled with blacklit creatures. Guests would then encounter the lost city of Atlantis along with mystical creatures like mermaids, a serpent, and a giant squid attacking the Nautilus. This whole attraction was pretty cool, and it's no wonder why it was so popular with guests. It was an overall very impressive and practical journey through a Jules Verne adventure. This was also a time when Disney sold ticket books and people would pay per attraction. 20,000 Leagues was considered an e-ticket attraction, the highest category Disney would sell, and it was also among some of the highest attended attractions at the park. It did benefit from having a decent capacity of around 2,400 people an hour. Because it was an e-ticket attraction, it also generated decent sales, around $10 million worth a year adjusted for inflation. However, despite that, it was also the lowest profit-generating attraction in the e-ticket category. Its operating expenses dwarfed every other ride at the park at $7.4 million a year adjusted for inflation. For comparison, Haunted Mansion, a massive Omnimover ride that had a way higher capacity only cost around $4.4 million adjusted for inflation a year. So despite how popular 20k was, it consumed a lot of operating money just to keep it going, even this early on. So as time would pass, that problem would only get bigger. Regardless, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea would continue to operate over the next few decades, standing as a significant attraction at the Magic Kingdom and continuing to be a fan favorite. This was in part thanks to the 20 or so cast members per shift who worked at the attraction. 
One of them being Chris Cooper, who worked at 20K between 1991 and 1994. I know for me, one of the most special moments for me in my three years working there was I was working on the dock one day and this kid about 10 years old gets off the, uh, the boat. And he goes, that was awesome. I was like, yeah, it, it is. So I think for a certain age uh, where you're still, you can still focus on the magic, then yeah, it was a very magical experience. I just like to think that maybe someone stepped off that ride and decided they wanted to be a marine biologist or uh, some sort of engineer. And wow, we can do that. Man can do that. But I know in my time there in the early mid nineties, there's so many people got off the sub and said, oh, that's so fake. You can see the wires, blah, blah, blah. So as the nineties rolled in, the attraction was still suffering from high operational costs, perhaps still the highest in the whole park. The ride was now 20 years old, and the more it aged, the more it took to keep it going. Problems with air conditioning as well as general wear and tear had plagued the attraction through its history, and internally, it was well known that park operations were pushing to have it sunset. Though the attraction was certainly not falling apart, and many aspects were still working fine. The political atmosphere within the park was shifting, however. And this spawned rumors on the idea that the attraction might close. Curiously, it was omitted from the VHS promotional material for the Magic Kingdom in 1993. But without any cause for concern, on September 5th, 1994, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea would casually close for maintenance. The Orlando Sentinel made note of this, and they asked a Disney spokesperson, who said, quote, It will be back at an undetermined date and may include improved effects. Sounds like a very loose promise for a massive e-ticket attraction, but okay, sure. Now internally, the attraction was scheduled to be back in service by December 16th of the same year. As time went on, however, no work or announcement had been made. Instead, the lagoon was left untouched, with the submarines parked in a staggered configuration around the track. But then news finally came, with Disney Parks president Al Wise stating that the attraction would return for the summer of 1996. He said that guests should expect the same attraction, specifically saying, quote, We will go through and do a rehab, and add a few surprises. But shortly after this, the renovation was apparently scrapped. Internally, it was thought to have been too complicated and costly to perform. Though that is a little strange, because the entire attraction received a major rehab just six years prior. Again, a Disney spokesperson said that they would weigh their options, sort of leaving the attraction's future open-ended. But already, semi-permanent changes were being made. First, with clearing out the switchback queue area and using the load canopy as a meet and greet area called the Fantasyland Character Festival. The Nautilus submarines had also been cleared away from guest view, and canvas canopies with fake foliage had been hung over the rock entrances into the show building. Meanwhile, to the west of the lagoon, Ariel's Grotto had been opened up. Another meet and greet area that also featured a splash pad and a waterfall rock formation that flowed into the 20k lagoon. A part statue, part water fountain from Ariel's Grotto had also been erected in the water. It was pretty clear by this point that the attraction was not coming back anytime soon, and these semi-permanent installations were proof that Disney was abandoning their attraction. To further drive home the suspicion, the ride vehicles were then completely removed from the attraction and placed in the boneyard. That's actually the site along Bay Lake where the cancelled Persian Resort was going to be. The only official acknowledgement from Disney came in 1998, with the show designer stating simply that it was a very valuable piece of property. He went on to say that the next major attraction to occupy the site will take years of development. And that's exactly what would happen, as both the subs and the physical attraction would continue to sit this way for the next few years. Unbelievably, the massive lagoon filled with all 11.5 million gallons of treated water, plus all of its theming, would just stay in place completely untouched. With the track clearly visible underwater and the load station still in place, only the overgrown vegetation and lack of submarines were any indication of the attraction's weird state of limbo. In fact, it would remain this way for nearly a decade. Nine and a half years of the four-acre attraction, pretty much a quarter of Fantasyland, all just sitting abandoned. During this time and in the background, there were some rumors about what might be replacing it. Perhaps the most developed was a mountain, in some iterations taking the name Fire Mountain. 
But nothing was ever really concrete, and the location of this concept would change and ultimately never got greenlit. I remember hearing things like uh, it might be replaced with a, a Little Mermaid attraction or um, some sort of walkthrough attraction. And, and the thing about it was uh, the Fire Mountain. I remember hearing about these things maybe that last summer I was working there in 94. It was likely down to the sheer cost to demolish the attraction, which was holding Disney back from moving forward. And for a company in a corporate position that was more fragile than ever, parks were struggling to find the budget to replace it or even remove it. Ultimately, by early 2004, that demolition would finally come, first with draining the entire site. That revealed the sun-worn and corroded props in the main lagoon, which then began to be ripped out. However, inside the show building, well, things were a lot more eerie. Since 1994, all of the props formerly underwater had remained in place, also corroded and now in the process of being removed. In the dark, rather low height of the show building, standing from the wooden service catwalks, cast members, demolition, and salvage crews all took some truly incredible photos of the former attraction. With just about a foot or two of standing black water below, all of the showpieces were now exposed in no way a guest would have ever seen. Out of the water, they also showed how decayed everything had gotten, with these show scenes just sitting idly in the water, presumably without any maintenance for almost a decade. Sediment had settled on much of the fiberglass rockwork, while the waterline is a distinct indication of the amount of fading. Perhaps the most eerie section, though, is the Atlantis scene. The decapitated stone heads, along with all of the other stone structures, just feel so liminal. And both animatronic serpents are genuinely frightening, sitting there in around a foot of dark water in a pitch black room. Those, along with both disintegrating giant squids, are nightmare fuel. And it's pretty weird to think that all of this was just sitting here within the most visited theme park on Earth. But that wouldn't be for long, as shortly after these photos were taken in mid-2004, the show building's props and show scenes were then ripped out. Front loaders carried out everything else that had now turned into brown rubble, while the outside lagoon also got the same treatment. By fall of 2004, the demolition was complete, and crews brought in dirt to grade the land. During this fill of the site, only a fraction of the land would actually be used for something. That would be a very small kids' play area called Pooh's Playful Spot. The remaining perimeter of the former attraction was just graded with a decently tall berm that had thick landscaping surrounding it. With this transformation, Magic Kingdom lost not only an e-ticket attraction, but also a few acres of guest capacity, which is honestly pretty rare for the park. While all of this was happening, the subs in Disney's Boneyard would continue to rot away. They had sat here since the 90s and were clearly in rough shape. Finally, they were taken to another location on property. Here, they would be stripped for parts by a third-party auction house who would proceed to sell many of those stripped parts on eBay. The subs would continue to sit there for a little bit longer until they were buried in place in late 2005. Of the 12 ride vehicles that were built, only two were saved in their entirety. Both were treated for contaminants and sent on a barge to Disney's private island, Castaway Cay, sometime in the year 2000. They were then deliberately sunk in the snorkeling lagoon, allowing guests to swim right up to them. Though I'm honestly not sure what happened to the second one, as there really isn't a conclusive answer as to where it went. As I understand it, only one remains submerged in the snorkeling area to this day, though many of the distinctive design features have been broken off and just the core body remains. Meanwhile, back on the mainland, Magic Kingdom was gearing up to finally put all of this cleared land back to use. In 2009, they announced New Fantasyland, a massive expansion that was going to use up every square inch of the former attraction site. This new area would feature a bunch of new meet and greets, a big table service restaurant, a Dumbo relocation and expansion, along with a Little Mermaid attraction. However, this plan was altered slightly by 2011, replacing the center meet-and-greet area with a family coaster called Seven Dwarfs Mine Train. Ultimately, the Pooh's play area and Ariel's Grotto would close in 2010 to make way for construction. It would start almost immediately, transforming the site into the massive expansion for Fantasyland. 
which the opening of Seven Dwarfs Mine Train marked the end of in 2014. Besides Disney employees marking the opening of the Little Mermaid attraction by pouring the former 20,000 leagues water into it, plus a small nod to the Nautilus and the rock work, there really isn't much of a trace of the former attraction. Its entire footprint has been completely developed over, while only one ride vehicle still exists, albeit underwater. Well, I guess the other ride vehicles technically still do exist, but they're buried under Disney property. So until Disney ever digs them up, that's really it for this beloved opening day attraction. Now that's not to say the theme and spirit is entirely gone. Disney parks around the world have various takes on the same classic Jules Verne story. And remember, the ride system was an adaptation of Disneyland's, which does indeed still exist. Though weirdly, it too would close in the 90s and sit abandoned for years. But thanks to hard lobbying from Imagineers, the attraction was spared and reopened as Finding Nemo's submarine voyage. Likewise is Le Mystère du Nautilus at Disneyland Paris. It opened in 1994, ironically the park which caused the company's financial stress to put pressure to close the Florida attraction. Perhaps the most similar though is Tokyo Disney Sea's version of 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. Honestly, it might be the best adaption of this theme, which has guest pods that go on a similar journey, though not through actual water. Instead, water is filled between two glass panels in front of you to create the illusion that you're underwater. But I think people will always especially love the original attraction in Florida. One that was expertly developed as a ride concept that lasted for decades as a convincing and engaging attraction. In the end though, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea had so much going against it. Despite a relatively decent guest capacity, the amount of actual people being moved through the attraction was slower than others, and that's because the boarding process was much more complicated. Guests needed to descend down a narrow and steep set of stairs into the sub, and that took time. Obviously, this would also not make it ADA compliant in the years later. This often caused long lines to form with low hourly guest capacity. This was also an attraction that dealt with real elements. It had real treated water, both with props and moving vehicles in it, all of which would need to be serviced. If a prop or section of track needed minor attention, you couldn't just drain the whole lagoon. You had to send down qualified divers to make those repairs. I'm not going to say it was falling apart. But obviously, the subs were exhibiting some wear, some age. They're a boat that's in the water 24-7. All of this, of course, was very expensive. Even from day one, it required the most financial resources out of any other attraction in the park to keep it going. And while we don't know for sure, we can make an educated guess that cost only rose as both the ride system and vehicles aged. And those vehicles were also problematic, with sporadic air conditioning problems and diesel engine issues, since these were propelled by their own onboard power. Guests also reported minor leaks in the hull, and over the years, the tracks became bumpy. While guests still rated it very high and revered it as a classic, Magic Kingdom Park Operations wanted it gone. It was a constant headache for them, and I'm sure dragged down profit margins for the park as a whole. After Euro Disneyland opened and failed to generate profit, the company as a whole also became a lot more frugal, and park executives seized this opportunity to close the attraction for good. We may never know why Disney gave such erroneous quotes in the press, stating that the ride was safe from the wrecking ball, then saying it was just a refurb, then giving various reopening dates that would obviously never happen. It's been reported that Disney had internally announced the attraction was indeed going to close when it did in 1994. That was despite Disney publicly saying otherwise on the record. Regardless, they closed the attraction without any clear plans of what they were going to do with it. And that was clearly evident by the fact that the attraction sat abandoned for nearly a decade. In fact, it would turn out to be over 16 years until Disney World actually broke ground on a permanent replacement for the attraction. It's just a bizarre series of events. And while many may be sad that they missed the attraction or never got to experience it, at least the concept does live on in other iterations across Disney's theme park portfolio. And of course, the ride has been well documented by passionate fans, like those at 20kride.com, a great website which has enormously helped me for making this video. Perhaps all that's physically left of the attraction is a good metaphor for its story. An attraction that stayed above the water for all of its years operating, only for it to finally sink for good. Though in this case, it's now only 85 leagues from where it started. 
No matter where you go on the internet, your personal data is always being collected. It's really hard to avoid and that data is usually being sold through data brokers, which, as you probably know all too well, lead to spam emails and robo-phone calls. I have experienced these for years, and taking the time to manually submit requests to remove your data is very tedious, to say the least. That's why I've been using Incogni. They simplify the process of submitting requests to remove your data. They essentially just do it all for you. All you need to do is sign up, grant them access to remove your information, and watch the process. Since I signed up with them a few months ago, they've successfully suppressed over 30 data broker sites that have my information, many of them at a higher level of severity. Now I have some more peace of mind that Incogni is taking care of submitting requests to malicious data brokers who are banking on you not doing anything about it. Really, it's a great service that makes security incredibly simple. Plus, it's also very affordable, so you really can't go wrong. That's especially true when you use my code BRIGHTSUN at the link below, which will get you an exclusive 60% off an annual plan. Anyway guys, my name is Jake, and thank you very much for watching.